Hello, everybody, and welcome to the World Economic Forum's Davos Agenda for 2021. I am Hadley Gavel, CBC's anchor in the Middle East, and I am thrilled to introduce four fantastic panelists and Davos regulars who will be today to talk about uh, implementing stakeholder capitalism in the Middle East and North Africa. Now, of course, this is a topic that we cover on a daily basis at CNBC and all of this against the backdrop of a global pandemic, lots of worries about the future of growth, the future of economies, and frankly, the future of people. And when you think about this with regards to the MENA region in particular, we're talking about a projected contraction at the moment of over 5% of this region's GDP um, from last year, which could frankly be prolonged into this year and a lot further along the line. One of the things that we've been talking about, of course, within this idea of stakeholder capitalism is how you make a serious transition from what we've seen in the past in this part of the world, which is, of course, a lack of transparency and a lack of accountability. And we're going to hopefully address those points uh, with our panelists today. I want to introduce them now. Her Excellency, Rania Almashad, of course, the Minister of International Cooperation from Egypt. Rania, it's wonderful to have you with us on today's program. Alan Bajani, he's, of course, the CEO of Majid Al-Futam Group right here in the UAE. Mohamed Jaffer, he's the Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Kuwaiti Danish Dairy. Thank you so much for joining us, Mohamed. And, of course, Badr Jaffer, he's the CEO of Crescent Enterprises here in the UAE as well. Panelists, welcome. It's fantastic to have you. Now, of course, we have a bit of an interesting um, program today. Half of this session will be available to the public, and then half of this section will be available um, for World Economic Forum members and stakeholders. I do want to mention that, of course, this session is associated with WEF's Regional Action Group, and all of the folks that are going to be speaking on these panels today are a part of that group. Um, this is something, of course, that has been very, very dear to WEF's heart in terms of trying to build on what the community can do in terms of the business sector and the public sector um, to frankly make the world a better place and make businesses accountable um, for not just shareholders, of course, but the stakeholders as well, and really broaden this out within the seven principles of stakeholder capitalism. I want to kick off, though, in terms of talking about this. Um, first, um, with our panelists, Her Excellency, um, Rani Almashad, Your Excellency, I just want you to walk us through how you see this playing out with regards um, to the government, frankly, because as we say, transparency, accountability are, are key avenues um, and things that in this part of the year, world, having been out here for the last 12 years, oftentimes um, they've been, frankly, um, something that hasn't been addressed. How do you see this playing out with regards to the government? Thank you very much, Hadley, and uh, um, I also want to commend uh, the uh, uh, Davos and the Regional Action Group uh, because um, it's been uh, a fantastic uh, way to put together some of the uh, very important uh, principles that all of us uh, have been calling for. Um, since the beginning of the Regional Action Group meeting together, uh, these seven principles uh, have uh, been discussed in length. Uh, in our case, uh, for the government of Egypt, uh, if we take a look at the work we've been doing during 2020, during uh, the pandemic and before, uh, through our projects uh, that focus on uh, inclusivity, uh, uh, reforming the education system, uh, digitalization, also looking at a green recovery, many of these principles are sort of intertwined uh, in our uh, work. Uh, so it was a very nice way uh, to put it uh, formally uh, and of course, uh, what the pandemic has also taught us is that there's not a single uh, uh, entity, whether it's government by itself, private sector by itself, uh, or citizens and civil society by themselves that have the answer. Uh, it's a collective effort, and that's why uh, stakeholder capitalism in its essence uh, is uh, pushing for more collaboration. Everyone has a seat on the table so that we can uh, find solutions to the global problems that affect us on a local basis. Alan, I'd love you to weigh in at this point and just talk to us a little bit about the stakeholder capitalism metrics. You were the first um, person to sign on to this idea. Why did you do that? Why was that important? And frankly, when we talk about that kind of accountability, when we talk about that kind of transparency, um, how close are we, do you think, in this part of the world to achieving that? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Hadley. I think in our case, I mean, yes, we signed up. I'm very happy to be to, to be uh, part of this uh, 60, 61 companies and now 62 with Crescent that signed up to the to 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 the um, stakeholder capitalism uh, matrices. It, it is critical globally, but it's also critical for our region. And I'd like to focus the, the on the situation in our part of the world. Uh, the, the question is not just about matrices; it's also about principle. Uh, 
moving from shareholder capitalism to stakeholder capitalism, which has been at the big, at the at the very early stage of um, the World Economic Forum in in the very early 70s, and and finally 50 years later, the repercussions of it continue to to, to reverberate, and you've seen the business roundtable. Uh, uh, um, uh, basically endorsing it, and now we are in a different situation post-COVID. The, we continued in our part of the world, for, in, in my view, for too long to think about the, the fact that the business of business is business. And in reality, we have to change the mindset and really think about the global stakeholder ecosystem in order for us to be, to be able to really drive uh, the, uh, basically the agenda forward and uh, be mindful of the threats and uh, that that uh, that we face and that we face globally and we have a big role to play and this is where i think what but actually just said in terms of the commitment that we see from the public sector from minds and and policies in the public sector that really want to make a difference going forward we have as private sector uh, a big responsibility to meet them halfway and also to make sure that we together are able to basically bend the steel uh, and shape it in uh, in the right direction. Being aware of the importance of people, uh, the environment, making sure that governance is at the center of what we do and we are able to run uh, our business in a sustainable way, as well as being mindful of the uh, of, of of the overall environment that in this part of the world we are so blessed to have so many endowments in it that have been at the source of so many so much wealth and so many so much development is something that puts on us an even greater responsibility and uh, and this is why I am very excited to see that actually uh, we are joining this this global effort but also hopefully we will make uh, we will make. Uh, we will play kind of a role model there, and we will make others feel that this is this is possible. It is about transparency in our part of the world primarily, and I would say if there is one thing that we all have to uh, try to do more of and encourage others to do more of, and I know everyone is a uh, is, is I'm preaching to converters on, on on this panel, and and most of the people that are listening to us is actually transparency across the board. I want to bring in Mohammed on this as well. Obviously, talking about the private sector and the role of the private sector in making all of these come uh, these things come to be. I mean, when you think about this with regards to the bigger picture, obviously we're talking about this against the backdrop of a global pandemic. Lots of concerns, not just in this part of the world, but globally about security, about food security, and the future of that. Walk us through how you see um, this playing out with regards to the principles mitigating global health risks. I think when you're looking at it from the context of food security, we don't have a problem of shortage of food. I think the problem is the quality, the nutritional values of the food. And the pandemic has come and woken us up because there are a lot of issues. I mean, if you look at diabetes or um, uh, 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 associated problems with the diabetes, metabolic syndrome diseases, they are some of the number one killers uh, worldwide, and they have been so uh, not only in our part of the world, but in America, in China, in India. And they have gone unchecked for a very long period of time. Um, what the pandemic has done is focused its attention on these uh, failures that we've had, because all of these are preventable. So when we talk about the cooperation between government and, um, and, and, the, and the private sector, uh, you can ban sugar. Um, uh, as they have done now in Saudi Arabia by increasing the taxes on it. So foods that are contributing to ill health long term uh, become more expensive to buy. But the government will not be able to replace sugar. Uh, it's up to the private sector then to find out how do you ensure that the nutritional value of what you're offering to your consumers actually um, doesn't cause their livers to... Uh, uh, to be damaged, that it feeds their guts, that it is actually not contributing to um, their insulin uh, deficiencies. So when we're looking at the definition of what stakeholder capitalism uh, is, we want to make sure, first of all, that the stakeholder themselves uh, are not affected by what it is that you're doing. So if, you, if you're producing a food or providing a service, you want to make sure that this food, that this service doesn't harm the stakeholder. And I'm afraid that a lot of the uh, processed foods that we have in our supermarkets um, uh, uh, today, worldwide, um, cause a burden on the public purse because they cause problems long term for all of the citizens of uh, this planet. And this is not sustainable going forward. So 
That's one element. The other element, of course, is for it to be sustainable so that whatever good or service you're producing, that um, it, it, it is good for the planet, not only for, uh, for the humans. Uh, and this can create some tensions sometimes between what if something is good for the planet but not good for the consumers, or what's it good, good for the consumer and not good for the plant. So there are, it's a complex uh, matter, but it's a very good start. I'm very pleased that the light has been focused on this matter uh, uh, through the forum, uh, because this, this is something that is long, long uh, due, and we look forward to a continued relationship with other stakeholders and all stakeholders uh, on this platform. Absolutely. And I think it's interesting that you, meant that you mentioned that when we talk to folks like Larry Fink all the time about the idea that, you know, at this point, his shareholders are expecting and demanding that a large portion of the things that they invest in and get involved in at the end of the day has to be uh, user friendly, if you will. I mean, sustainable investing is something that we talk about on CNBC on an ongoing basis. I want to bring in Bader on this one as well in terms of the role that he feels that private sector leaders are going to need to play in shaping this more resilient and sustainable future. And Bader, I know this is something you and I have been talking about for about a decade, so there's no one better place really to talk about this, even though I have just dated myself. Thanks, Hadley. Uh, always good speaking with you and uh, great to be with friends on this panel. Taking a step back, uh, all these buzzwords, stakeholder capitalism, ESG, uh, triple bottom line, they're all fundamentally expressions of sustainability. And to me, sustainability is not a destination or a finish line. It's a way of thinking and being, a compass point, if you will, for businesses and individuals towards balancing social, environmental, and economic factors in harmony with one another because you need all three to make it work. So if we break these three things down uh, in the context of the MENA region specifically, uh, social sustainability can only be achieved if we create enough opportunities for our youth. It's estimated that more than 10% of working hours in the region were wiped out in 2020 due to COVID. That's the equivalent of 24 million full-time jobs lost. But we also must be careful because a single-minded focus on job creation prevents us from seeing the true challenge and opportunity that lies ahead of us, which is instilling a strong sense of purpose and a feeling of belonging within our youth. You know, the, the WEF's uh, Global Risk Survey clearly highlights the youth disillusionment and erosion of social cohesion as critical threats to the world. Therefore, we urgently need to deploy all the tools at our disposal to strengthen the fabric of our local communities, including through things like community service and uh, volunteerism. Now, on environmental sustainability, the Middle East is especially vulnerable to climate shocks and uh, faces a host of environmental risks such as uh, water scarcity, uh, high levels of pollution, uh, and biodiversity loss. And as I said to uh, someone a few days ago who argued that uh, in a crisis, economic considerations trump everything else, if you really think the economy is more important than the environment, or even health for that matter, just try holding your breath while you count your money. And then of course, uh, there's economic sustainability. And for the MENA region, this depends on our ability to continue diversifying our economies and to properly embrace the seismic shifts taking place uh, as a result of the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, the UAE, for example, has uh, set clear national goals for a more sustainable future uh, through numerous initiatives, including uh, a focus, of course, on the digital economy, boosting SME participation, which is critical, uh, and, of course, the UAE Energy Strategy 2050, which sets a target of 50% clean energy by 2050. Uh, our own Crescent Group's uh, evolution uh, through uh, Crescent Enterprises has mirrored uh, this broader regional drive for diversification. Uh, and today, over 70% of our group revenue uh, comes from outside the energy sector. Uh, in fact, uh, Crescent Enterprises is in the process of releasing our 10th annual sustainability report, uh, integrating economic, social, environmental, and uh, governance metrics uh, across our four platforms. Uh, and we're glad to announce uh, today that we're one of the first companies in the region to adopt uh, and implement uh, the WEF's stakeholder capitalism metrics, uh, and, and of course, are proud to do so. A final point I'll make is 
that each of these imperatives will differ in nature across the region, with uh, different countries having different strengths and weaknesses uh, that will impact how they get the job done. The question is, whose job is it to get us there? Well, as far as I'm concerned, the greatest multiplier to our problems is the belief that someone else will solve them. Every sector has an important role to play uh, in this agenda, and we will fail if any one of us chooses to sit it out. Governments, businesses, the academic sector, uh, media can all do more together than any one of us can do uh, on our own. And we mustn't also make the mistake of forgetting people in this partnership model. We need feedback loops with the ultimate beneficiaries, our youth, so that the solutions that we're working towards are relevant and uh, necessary for our societies. I want to pick up on a point that Bader just made, obviously, about um, each country is different, each society is different. I mean, at the end of the day, when you've got 100 million people that you have to figure out um, how to feed and, frankly, how, uh, how to employ, uh, Ron, you come in on this one because we're talking about, against the backdrop of this global pandemic, governments across the West printing more and more money and basically paying people to stay home. But that just doesn't work for every country. And in terms of what Egypt is doing, you've made so many strides um, with regards to solar and with regards to renewables, but at the same time, there's a heck of a long way to go. Well, uh, thank you, Hadley. You mentioned uh, in your uh, opening remarks that there's a contraction of 5% in the region. Uh, Egypt grew this year uh, above 2% and expectations for 2021 uh, is around 5%. And that comes uh, against the backdrop uh, of governments starting on reforms very early on. So when 2020 hit uh, with an unexpected shock of this magnitude, uh, we were ready. We were ready uh, by uh, fiscal buffers, monetary and foreign exchange buffers. But even more importantly, uh, with infrastructure uh, on education, on social protection, uh, on uh, universal health insurance. All of this helped uh, uh, the country tremendously uh, in weathering uh, the impact. You mentioned uh, the solar projects, and let me put here our mandate as Ministry of International Cooperation. Uh, we are Egypt's window to international, uh, uh, the international community when it comes to development partners, uh, whether bilaterals or multilaterals, such as EBRD, IFC, um, uh, the African Development Bank, uh, and many of the projects uh, that uh, are related to infrastructure, on transportation, on sustainable cities, uh, on housing, uh, water desalination, all of those have been done with our international uh, partners. Uh, and they have proven to be extremely important uh, during the pandemic. Uh, you mentioned also transparency in your opening remarks. We just issued uh, our annual report. And in that, for the first time, you find uh, a very detailed accounting of all the projects that Egypt has engaged with, uh, uh, with, our, with the international community. Uh, even in 2020, a very tough year, a challenging year with respect to liquidity, we were able to secure development financing of $10 billion, which, which you know, speaks for the commitment of the government to push forward the various SDGs. Uh, Bedr mentioned people at the core. Uh, our global partnership narrative now has uh, three Ps. Uh, people and projects and purpose, people at the core, projects in action, and purpose as the driver. When we talk about the seven uh, principles uh, of stakeholder capitalism, uh, in our work, uh, we have been able to also map them, each one of them, uh, to the various SDGs. And this is very, very important uh, because uh, citizens, civil society, private sector, and government all have to work together uh, towards achieving the 2030 agenda, which is only nine years away. Uh, and uh, I find that uh, through the cooperation that we have uh, with uh, our partners in the region and with the WEF, we will be able to push this message even uh, stronger uh, going forward, uh, whether it's uh, messages of digitalization, gender equality, uh, green recovery and environmental uh, sustainability, uh, pushing uh, the private sector uh, towards ESG as well, the government providing the regulatory environment for that. I think uh, uh, the silver lining in uh, 2020 and around COVID has been a realization that all these principles are tangible, they're real, and they can be implemented and executed. Absolutely. And we just hit a significant milestone, frankly, for Egypt, 10 years 
after Tahrir. Um, but I want to ask Alon to come in on this one because we talk so much about the government um, across the region and transparency, lack thereof, the need to do more, the need to get on the ball very, very quickly, um, specifically with regards to, um, you know, allowing for the private sector to really do its job in terms of regulations. Where are we with that today in your view? I think that uh, the, the glass is half full. I think the, the half full part of the glass is is uh, primarily in the fact that the government now is much more aware of the importance of public-private partnerships. And I think we hear more and more uh, uh, a narrative about how to actually engage with the private sector, which I think is important. We have a much better, I would say, legislative framework across, uh, across the region when it gets to engaging the private sector. But the reality, especially in the economies that matter the most, is that we still continue to see uh, an inherent desire uh, by the government or the public sector, let's say, in general, to actually engage and have a more, I would say, directive role about, how, about growth uh, that some, somehow uh, comes across as competing with the, with the private sector. I think the, the, um, the pie is, is big enough, uh, and I definitely think that a more... I would say engaging uh, posture with the with the private sector will, will go a longer way in in driving sustainable growth. I don't think we're there yet, uh, but although I believe that we are much more aware of the importance of it, but what does it mean and how we translate that in reality is something that at time uh, is, is is somewhere where at times we collectively fail and we can do much better. I really believe that the private sector in the region can actually contribute much more to GDP, and I think this will only unlock the real potential of this region through uh, better economic integration, through uh, uh, enlarging the size of our market, through uh, working seriously on stakeholder capitalism and driving uh, the principles of stakeholder capitalism will also be able to drive much more FDI into our markets. Uh, unfortunately, one of the uh, downsides, I would say, of the COVID, of the COVID crisis. Of, I mean, I would say of the of 2020, and and hopefully we will find a way around it. Is the fact that we've seen a lot of attitudes about governments wanting to how do I deal with my own issues, which is understandable. Uh, but I think we have a big role to play as private sector to actually push towards better and more integration, and finding global solutions to global problems. Or, and in our case here, regional solution to regional problems, because I don't think anyone can deal with this issue or similar issues that would certainly come our way uh, in the future on our own. We have to Bottom. know to learn how we complement each other rather than, rather than how do we compete against each other. Bader, weigh in on this one, because we talk so often about the private sector um, uh, in, on terms of CNBC and just looking at the numbers. And frankly, this part of the world with lower oil prices, a lot of fear about investing um, and putting their money out there at this point, especially with regards um, to governments, as, as Alain was saying, being very, um, um, very much about their own agendas at this point, which, as he say, he says, is in fact understandable. What is the number one thing that you need as an investor and as a leader in the private sector? What you need to hear from these governments in order to feel more comfortable putting more money out there and employing more people, and frankly, making a more sustainable business environment. So just we talked a bit about the government role, the private sector role. There's one more piece to the puzzle, I think, that deserves, uh, I think, more attention than it often gets in the MENA region, and that's philanthropic capital. Uh, for far too long, philanthropy has been treated like the uh, neglected child of our capital system, uh, seen by many as a uh, peripheral player and, and sometimes regarded with a high degree of suspicion. Uh, the reality is that over $350 billion of private philanthropic capital, more than the global annual development and humanitarian aid budgets combined, is deployed every year in and from our region. So this is a huge space, and we need to think about strategic philanthropy as a mainstream intervention, uh, another tool at our disposal, if you will, that can help us to uh, overcome our greatest challenges and to help plug uh, the estimated annual gap of uh, $2.5 trillion that the world needs to fill if we are to have any hope of uh, achieving the SDGs by 2030. 
look, and on the, the question about the governments, the governments obviously have a leading role to play in addressing governments, uh, uh, social and environmental challenges. They alone have, uh, in many ways, the power in our region to articulate the vision and implement policies to make it happen and set the rules uh, of the road. They also deploy significant amounts of, of capital in our region. However, one of the most important things that the governments can do is to put in place the right incentives and disincentives, um, along with uh, an enabling regulatory framework that encourages others, uh, including businesses, but also, as I mentioned, philanthropists, to get off the sidelines and make their own contributions. Business, in my uh, humble opinion, uh, which, as you said, I've been ranting on about for well over a decade, <laughs> uh, has no other choice but to be at the forefront of addressing our region's social and economic challenges. It's not so much just because it's a moral imperative, it's a long-term commercial one, because as we've seen again and again, there does not have to be a trade-off between profit and purpose. Uh, on the contrary, the inextricable link between long-term economic success and positive societal impact is becoming increasingly clear for all to see, uh, including uh, the big skeptics uh, out there. And you know who you are. <laughs> Mohammed, I, I want to ask you specifically about something that, that we've been talking about as well within the World Economic Forum for several years now, of course, and that's the fourth industrial revolution, how to harness technology um, to really uh, help businesses and young people specifically um, with this transition. And now against the backdrop of the pandemic, how important do you think um, is that kind of um, engagement when it comes uh, really to, to the challenges ahead? Well, I don't think we can live away from uh, technology. And uh, when you're trying to improve the systems that you have, when you're relying on artificial intelligence, when you're relying on uh, all the advances that are taking place um, in food business, for example, you, you must be up there. And, and the region, the, the young in the region are very uh, adept are at using the technology. But at what is this technology being used? Now, having a Twitter account is one thing and being active on social media is one thing, but we've often been accused of having missed um, some of the um, earlier revolutions. So uh, how do we harness this um, uh, this existing uh, uh, you know, technical revolution, the fourth industrial revolution, uh, and prepare for, for, for the next one? I think having, preparing our young, skilling them and reskilling them for the jobs of the future is very important. I think in this respect, um, we haven't done enough. Uh, we must do much, much more because unemployment is uh, an issue in our region. Um, youth unemployment is an issue. And the matching the skills of the youth for the jobs of the future is another critical uh, systemic failure that we have. And um, at a time when, yes, uh, there is a decline in GDP, uh, there is a decline in revenues, there is a pandemic at hand. How do you focus the attention of the governments on those issues that to them, you know, they seem to be drowning in this pandemic? And we need to ensure that the pandemic does not overshadow everything else, including issues, costs that are much more important long term than what the pandemic is doing to us in terms of cost and paralysis uh, today. So, but there are basics. I just want to touch on one thing. Um, Someone mentioned, you know, the role of governments and and, and do, the, uh, do our governments understand the, w what stakeholder capitalism is? There is a country in the Gulf, and I will not name this country, whose air pollution, the quality of its air, is possibly the worst in the world. Now, this is due to a production of carbons. This is the government. Now, they could do something about it, but they don't, and they haven't. So how can governments lead by example when, how can they come and tell you to be more sustainable when they themselves are not being sustainable? I think governments have to take a very hard look at the costs long term of their actions and start to ensure, you know, it may mean for government that it, the production of its oil or gas is going to be um, more expensive because they're implementing, because they're producing cleaner air. The fact that you know, people aren't falling dead today because they're breathing bad air, 
um, doesn't mean that it's good for them. It means that, like with everything else, like with this business of dealing with diabetes and uh, and and uh, and uh, the the um, syndrome diseases, we're kicking the can into the future. We need to stop doing that. We really need to start thinking about the costs, incredible costs of inaction today. And this is where metrics will play a role. But it's also a matter of, of mindset, changing the mindset of uh, government, of consumers, and of uh, shareholders uh, also. Mm. 